are looking at one of the most terrible sights in history. The pens are dry that ripped through the Maginot Line and took Paris in 40 days. 40 days! But the military authorities had said that this was... Impossible. At such speed, a mechanized army would outrun its supplies and be stranded. But the Nazis did not outrun their supplies. Why? Because right behind the Panzers came the German engineers, throwing bridges over rivers, laying roads for the supply trucks, keeping their machines constantly fed. For the French armies, the end was death. For the British, Dunkirk. And the Nazis boasted, we will keep what we have won. Our engineers will fortify this coast so that no nation will ever be able to land a mechanized army on Fortress Europa. But this time, the Nazis were mistaken. Among the men who were to prove them wrong were the Navy-created Seabees, seagoing constructioneers whose answer always is can do. Under the direction of the Civil Engineer Corps, they were to build and fight all over the world, in the Atlantic, the Pacific, against Germans, against Japs. These men were recruited from American workmen, expert mechanics, carpenters, factory foremen, the men who had built America. They were not all young men. When the Marines first saw some of these old timers, they said, never hit a CV, his grandson might be a Marine. Many were boys who had built their own radio sets and made their own jalopies out of spare parts. But now these kids had to do infinitely more than take apart a motor. They had to help take apart Germany's defenses. That meant rigorous training, for these men had to learn to fight as well as to build. These were the men the Navy was depending on to build the huge invasion bases, to invent some means for landing tons of material on enemy beaches under fire, to keep more supplies moving across water and through surf than the Germans could keep moving across roads to start these supplies flowing within minutes after the first assault waves landed. Their first job was typically tough, typically urgent. In the British Isles, harbors were choked with crippled ships. These ships had to be repaired quickly, put back into action. In little old seaport towns like Londonderry and Roseneath, the first contingent was landed. A modern fighting construction corps thrust into an old world atmosphere. Right away, the Yankee construction crews were confronted with uh, traffic problems. But neither beef nor beefing could stop them. They broke up the old world atmosphere, although the Luftwaffe was breaking it up a good deal more. New camps began to spring up. In great secrecy, work on repair bases for the crippled fleet had already been started by civilian construction crews working under the direction of officers of the Civil Engineer Corps. The newly arrived units threw all their energies to rush to completion the docks, warehouses and machine shops at these bases. American factories were turning out machines on day and night schedules. Into these machines went the fuel denied American pleasure drivers. Out of them came a new fleet, built from ships the Germans thought were flop houses for fishes. To refuel the six to eight ships that were docking every day, men from Texas and Oklahoma threw miles of pipeline across swampy rocky country. To store the oil, they constructed tank farms covering acres with large steel tanks. In America, such tanks were built by bolting the steel plates together. Here, some of the plates had to be welded. But there were some of the men who used to be welders. They taught the others. Then it was found each tank had to have a brick wall for protection against bomb fragments. Two of the men turned out to be ex-bricklayers. They showed the others how it was done. In seven months, more repair work was done than the old established yards had turned out during the entire First World War. Here is a typical base repair job. A destroyer on submarine patrol is caught by Stukas.
she limps away, trailing smoke and leaking badly. Her distress signal is picked up by a newly completed radio station. When the destroyer reaches the repair docks, ambulances of the medical corps are waiting to take off the wounded. The injured are rushed to a hospital at the base. There, doctors are standing by, ready for an emergency operation. You are watching an actual operation performed on a few minutes' notice in the Londonderry Hospital. Meanwhile, Navy repair crews are swarming over the ship. Thanks to American skill, the destroyer was repaired between tides and returned to action the same day. Seabees worked with these repair crews. Several remarkable records were set up. They changed the propeller of the USS Greer in a few hours. Shortly afterward, they fitted out the USS Williamsburg with new propeller shafts, turn tubes, and bearings. The Canadian Corvette Calgary had all the bearings in her main engines replaced at the same time, a feat never before accomplished. Said General Patch, It has been a constant wonder to me how the Seabees could possess so many skills and do such a huge amount and variety of work. While this work, a defensive fighting measure, went on, the Germans were moving through Romania, Bulgaria, Greece, Crete, Northern Africa, and half of Russia. The first break came on the desert at El Alamein. Marshal Rommel's forces were defeated, and the Germans were thrown out of Africa. At last, we had bases from which to launch an offensive against the Axis Europe at the soft underbelly of Sicily and Italy. Compared to the Atlantic Wall, this was indeed the soft underbelly. But powerful shore batteries protected the combined German and Italian armies. With the barriers were strong natural defenses. The worst of these were long shelving beaches. The Axis counted heavily on these beaches. The Allies landing craft will ground in the shallow water a hundred yards from shore. Men perhaps can swim to the beach, but the enemy can't swim tanks, heavy trucks or artillery. Our shore batteries can pick off their grounded landing craft like sitting ducks. These beaches are practically invincible. In London, the Allied Supreme Council met to consider the problem of the invincible beaches. They debated every way of unloading the LSTs rapidly. Unless the landing force could get tanks and artillery ashore quickly, the beachhead would be wiped out. It would be D.F. Van Dunkirk all over again. It was an extremely difficult problem. But the Navy's pontoon causeway development offered a possible solution. There was an officer in the Navy Civil Engineer Corps named Captain John N. Laycock, who, even before the war, had everybody in his office saving cigar boxes for him. And from a study of these boxes came one of the most important developments of the war. Here are models of this development, the Navy's pontoon, designed to stand a terrific strain. Fasten 50 of these boxes together and you have a barge. Pile other boxes on the sides of the barge and you have a floating dry dock. Secure three strings of them side by side and you have a floating causeway that could bridge the distance from a stranded LST to the shore. The little model boxes worked perfectly, but how would the real boxes work under shell fire on enemy beaches? With a top secret classification, steel boxes were built. The CBs experimented with the boxes, found they worked. They called their pontoons the Jeep of the CBs. But learning to handle the floating boxes was a whole new art. Learning to ride them in a heavy sea, a brand new way to get killed, unless you knew how. They had to find out the hard way. There was no book of directions. They weren't learning a new form of warfare. They were inventing it. Finally, the pontoon crews were given their orders. From bases in Scotland, they and the steel boxes were secretly embarked for North Africa. For the first time, these skilled workmen were to go under fire in the European area. They had boasted that they could protect what they built. 
Well, they would get a chance to prove it. In Tunisia, they went ashore to prepare for the first invasion of Axis Europe. The boys who had driven jalopies down Main Street and beach wagons in Londonderry were a long, long way from home now. The British Isles had seemed a little old-fashioned, but at least the English had heard of the automobile. No wonder the Germans had seemed like supermen to the Tunisians. They just didn't know the Americans. In the port of Bizerte, a great invasion fleet was being assembled. Plans were going forward. Aerial reconnaissance reported that the enemy's strength was being concentrated in northern Sicily. The southern coast was only lightly held. The German generals evidently believed that 500 feet of shallow water would stop an invasion as surely as a 500-foot wall. The brass hats decided to hit the southern beaches and trust to the Navy's pontoons. The men had a few weeks to complete their experiments. The original plan had been to tow the pontoons behind the LSTs, but the naval officers were afraid that this would slow down the landing craft too much. But as usual, changes were quickly made that would do the trick. A way was devised for hanging the pontoons from the sides of the LSTs. Next, the Army engineers objected that a pontoon long enough to reach the shore could not be kept rigid. In heavy surf, it would sway too much for trucks and tanks to be driven across it. This objection was solved by using two pontoons, slightly overlapping, one extending beyond the other like a slide rule. Thus, each pontoon reinforced the other. The day before the invasion of Sicily, the world had waited three years to see this fleet set sail, the fleet that was to strike the first blow at Axis Europe. It had taken weeks to build the earthen causeways over which hundreds of tanks and trucks were loaded on LSTs. Unloading in Sicily was to be done on the pontoons secured now on the sides of the LSTs. Everything was ready for the big show. At dawn, the fleet stood out to sea. This was it, one of the decisive undertakings of the war. A successful landing in Sicily would mean the virtual end of Mussolini's power. The German military authorities had assured Il Duce that a landing in Sicily was impossible. The Germans were right, as far as an ordinary invasion fleet was concerned. They just hadn't heard about the Navy's pontoons. Sicily. As the landing craft charged the beach, the shore batteries opened up. The German and Italian officers must have thought the Americans had gone crazy or had lost their sounding charts. As the landing craft came closer to the shoaling water, crews cast off all but two cables with trip hooks holding the pontoons. The water was shoaling fast. The LSTs dropped their ramps. Below decks, the order was given to start the tank engines. In the chart room, the soundings were checked off. In a few minutes, the ships would ground. Pontoons away. For a few moments, the LSTs towed the pontoons with the CB crews aboard. Then the ships grounded. The pontoons surged forward, carried by their own momentum. In a matter of seconds, their crews had guided them into place. 